All right. I still see a lot of people joining, which is great, but we'll uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to week nine of our 10-week CubeSec Enterprise online webinar series. We've had just tremendous interest in this program, and uh, you know we're, we're we'll, we will do it again, but we're you know uh, our, our, it'll be a few more months before we kick it off again. But we've we've had some great sessions, and today's session is no different. Uh, we will. Uh, I think you're going to really enjoy it. Uh, so uh, let me, before we get started, just walk you through a little bit of the logistics. We are have everybody on mute. We will be taking questions. If you do have any questions, please use the, use the GoToWebinar questions panel uh, over there on the side. So uh, if we can advance to the next slide, I'll walk through uh, today's uh, the, 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 the other elements here. Um, so go ahead and use your questions panel, um, and we'll you know we'll we'll we'll, we'll, we'll take them that way. Uh, we'll try to handle them um, you know in real time if they're relevant to what uh, our speaker is talking about. Otherwise, we'll save it for Q and A towards the end. We are recording today's session. You'll get a copy or you'll get a link to that recording um, you know after today's event, and you can uh, share it with some others on your team if you find it interesting and we're very we're also very interested in your feedback towards the end uh, so we will be sending out a survey along with that uh, confirmation uh, after the event we'd, we'd love to hear what you think and if you'd like to be part of our next program you know let us know that too we'll keep track of it if you if you feel like you have a, a topic that would be of interest oh. to the audience for our future series so um, let me turn to today's event now uh, we're excited to have uh, Riaz from Cloudo here with us, and the topic uh, that he'll be discussing today is is really interesting. In that, you know, a lot of times as security people, I think we take the perspective of let's uh, of, of uh, in our own perspective, how do we lock things down? But one of the best ways to understand what's happening is to look at you know how are these people, uh, the bad guys, you know, aiming at your 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 environment? How are they getting in, and what does it look like when they're in? And Riaz will be walking you through, you know, exactly what people look at when they're targeting your environment, and um, and how does it look in your systems from your perspective? What can you see? And and of course, you know, beginning to think about what do you do as a reaction. So with that, let me turn it over to Riaz, today's presenter, and uh, look forward to to any of your questions. Uh, we'll keep an eye on that as we go. All right. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Andy, for that. Uh, okay. Uh, good morning and uh, good evening, folks. Uh, for people joining in, uh, joining with us from different parts of the planet, um, the idea of uh, today's uh, presentation stemmed from an internal uh, discussion we had, right? Uh, where we were trying to understand, from an attacker's perspective, what is it that is visible to an attacker, and how does an attacker traverse? all the way from obtaining initial access, right? And all the way to the impact that the attacker wants to cause within the cluster of the infrastructure that the attacker is targeting. The question that we would then pose to uh, our customers would be, are you, are you certain, right? That you know who exactly is in your pod or to rephrase it, who else is in your pod, right? And the whole idea was to get an attacker's approach to Kubernetes security, right? Uh, I'd like to shout out to my uh, co-founder Akash and uh, my team here, as well as uh, Matt, if you've joined us, uh, thumbs up. <laughs> Thank you for joining this session as well. <coughs> I'm uh, one of the co-founders of uh, Cloudal Inc. I, I, my work primarily deals with offensive security at Cloudal. Uh, I have over a decade of experience with breaking applications, which has truly transitioned into uh, now focusing on container and Kubernetes security. Um, throughout my entire career, I've looked at uh, applications or any infrastructure that is given to us, right? Uh, regardless of whether it's any new tech, the questions that uh, I ask, the approach that I have always taken is to, uh, you know, align myself with what, what would an attacker do and ask relevant questions around that so that you could apply that defensively and then say, oh, if you are an attacker, I have this in place, right? So the defensive parts of what uh, we ask also become clear. Uh, I also have multiple certifications, uh, which I've uh, gathered over the years as part of my learning curve, CK and CCAT being the latest 
of them because kubernetes as a technology itself is really new to me and uh, my entire approach to learning that as well has been uh, through an, an offensive side all right let's jump into uh, what we're going to be covering today the uh, the entire presentation is kind of divided into three subsections i would say with uh, with us starting uh, and asking the question are you or rather uh, rephrasing that do you know what your organization's footprint looks like on the internet right are you aware of what uh, your organization exposes your employees expose your uh, you know infrastructure administrators expose the second part of uh, today uh, today's presentation will deal with actually asking relevant questions around what would your uh, what would an attacker do to get inside an infrastructure or attack a kubernetes cluster itself right what are the tactics and techniques uh, they are using and we are heavily going to map all the tactics and techniques that we are going to look at with examples taken from real world uh, cases as well as our uh, pen testing engagements that we've done around kubernetes we'll map them to the mitre attack uh, you know the threat matrix that microsoft has created and we'll, we'll uh, spend some time with that as well like going through all the tactics we'll finally end the presentation uh, with the uh, last section being around what would you do uh, to minimize the spread of an attack or to prevent an attack in the first place and all of these recommendations that we will talk about at the end of the presentation come from uh, what i have seen as an offensive uh, security specialist right <clears throat> let's jump straight in oh we have a poll here <laughs> and you want to take over Yeah, definitely. So um, before we, uh, Riaz gets into his talk, we'd be we're interested in uh, you know what you've all seen. So go ahead and uh, select one of the answers. Have you faced any internal or external breaches? You know, essentially, have you been hacked? Um, you know, specifically in your, your your Kubernetes world here. I mean, obviously, if you're in security, you go back 20 years to to network hacks. That's different, but. Uh, you know, have you been hacked in your Kubernetes environments? And, you know, the answer is multiple breaches. <laughs> you don't have to tell us the details. You've had a breach, but you feel like you dealt with it well. Um, you know, you, you you feel like there were attacks, but you actually were able to prevent them. Um, and then, wow, you've never been breached. We're so good, you know, <laughs> and, uh, or maybe you just don't know. And so go ahead and pick one and, you know, uh i'll give you a, another 20 or 30 seconds here just to pick your answers and then we'll share the results um and and see how we're doing so uh i see a lot of the the answers coming in here uh it's interesting just... andy because uh when when we try and uh, phrase this question in, in a public forum right um the answer changes based on anonymity Right. So you wouldn't want you wouldn't want a lot of folks to figure out that hey, you know what, I've been breached, but yeah, I get kind of embarrassed about it because we left our keys out in the open on GitHub, for example. Right. And essentially accepting uh, the uh, the idea behind, hey, I've been breached and this is what I've done to change security helps in learning for the larger community as well. Right. So yeah, that's, so that's what interestingly, trying. you know, about half the audience is confident that, you know, so far, at least in their Kubernetes world, they haven't been breached, um, you know, and or, you know, are unaware of it. If it, it certainly hasn't had a major impact or they would know. Um, but, you know, uh, and, and a number of people are pretty confident that they even if an attempt was made, they were able to thwart it. Does this what do you think about these results, Riaz? <laughs> Oh, but they kind of align, but then that's the the last uh, option that is that they never breached. That's what we know of our infrastructure is is uh, you know a little misleading because uh, if if you're all familiar with what happened with the latest uh, the solar winds attack that happened, multiple organizations were affected and they did not know for a long long time that they were they were attacked, right? So that's that's always going to be the case. Right. <coughs> all right. Um, all the right, polls closed, I suppose. Yeah, sure. <laughs> the, <laughs> I'd like to begin with the meme, right? The, the essential idea has always been that uh, when you ask, uh, especially when uh, during conferences or uh, during interactions, or uh, when they're on polls as well, the uh, standard response has always been the, the more common one has been that we don't have a lot of uh, uh, you know stuff that we expose on the internet. We're careful about what uh, what we do, right? But let's take a look at what, as an attacker over the years, I have seen people expose, right? And attackers tend to use these to then focus, channel their attacks to specific regions of their infrastructure, 
trying to gain access to a bigger set of the, the pipe that exists on your network right and a lot of these uh, a lot of this information occurs to you as an organization occurs to you as something that's required as part of uh, you being you know for your existence right but for an attacker all of these tend to become pieces of information that they can chain together right uh, the most common information pieces i've seen come from employee information uh, which exist on forums or linkedin right the profiles contain what technology that uh, you're using within your organization internet technology details that uh, you know a lot of companies post uh, detailed job uh, postings on public forums uh, responses to stack overflow dev to responses the blog posts that companies write all of these leak some kind of technological information uh, to attackers uh, a common uh, source of information for attackers bug bounty hunters you know whatever your uh, motive is uh, dns records uh, dns uh, ip history ip ranges all of these tend to become a lot of good sources of information uh, tcp ip services that get detected by internet wide port scans an attacker need not even run a port scan against your infrastructure there are services that provide you provide details of what's running on on your network simply by querying for your ip addresses or your organization and shodan being one of them right app stack the os server version information by http headers page responses uh, a very common piece uh, a recurring theme we've seen is for a lot of uh, folks uh, they embed uh, developers tend to embed keys and secrets inside javascript and then they uh, assume the the minification or the uh, you know compressed format of javascript to become an obfuscation technique right but attackers tend can easily reverse engineer this or see that in the javascript console in the browser uh, a very interesting source of information and a bunch of you can try this out uh, look at the pdf file properties that exist for uh, file uploads on your own website right as an organization we produce a lot of content we may have ebooks we may have spec documents we may have uh, you know uh, job postings documents that are hosted uh, on our websites if you download any of these pdf files and look at file properties you'll be able to see the software that was used to create uh, the document potentially the username uh, if it was created on a windows or a mac, a mac machine and all sorts of interesting uh, things including file parts sometimes if you look into the pdf uh, metadata yeah Riaz, uh, you know, let me jump in yes. here uh, you know, we've we've had some data from our own threat research team at aqua and you know what, yeah. what's fascinating is when you know they'll, they'll do honey pots and they'll put up a new kubernetes cluster <laughs> and it's a matter of minutes before people are attacking it like like you said yes. those port scans yeah. and everything else the dns yeah. you know ip range yeah. all that stuff they've automated the process of finding new places to go so yes. it, it doesn't take much yes I, a lot of organizations tend to uh, you know have staging and dev environments that are misconfigured because they don't restrict the kind of traffic or sources of traffic that are going to be coming to those uh, endpoints right so that's that's a particularly interesting case uh, default credentials for third party apps a lot of large companies uh, you know tend to pay out uh, large amounts of money to bug bounty hunters because they found an endpoint which you could log in using an admin and admin credential right so they, this has happened in in the real world as well uh, the tendency to use older and vulnerable software packages that don't um, you don't update periodically, right? That also becomes an attack footprint uh, for your organization. Hidden files, uh, configuration files, repositories on GitHub Bitbucket, right? All of these commits containing secrets, all of these tend to become your source for uh, the attack, right? Your attackers tend to gather information about your organization using these, and this is not a complete set. This is this is just the tip of the iceberg, right? But do folks really expose stuff online, right? That's that's the question, regardless of uh, the claim that I'm making. And uh, when I was creating this presentation, I tend to uh, I uh, sat out to see. Uh, I, let's let's actually try and um, answer the claim, uh, rather uh, prove the claim that I'm trying to make. Uh, what is it that I can see by doing a quick search for the sources that I mentioned? And what I noticed was attack, organizations tend to leave information on the internet all the time, right? These three screenshots show, uh, the first one shows the um, shows a bunch of Kubernetes clusters that are listening uh, to the internet. And uh, if, if a Kubernetes cluster has been started, the API server has been started with uh, priority and fairness uh, features, you would have the X Kubernetes PF flow schema hyphen UID. And that's a unique header uh, fingerprint that uh, Kubernetes will expose to the internet, right? So simply searching that on Shodan shows you the data results. 
this is a search that I did for deployment YAML, hoping to find uh, Kubernetes related uh, YAML files for deployments on uh, uh, Grey Hat Warfare, a pretty cool uh, search engine for buckets and storage on Azure. And this is uh, Vim underscore settings or JetBrains, the, the file that contains project information, sometimes uh, the history that uh, of the project itself, and sometimes confidential information can be on GitHub. Right? This is a, a peer search on GitHub that was done. And then just to just in an essence to figure out if what is it uh, that attackers tend to see and is it, how much is this uh, close to the real world like right? the claim that I made across all the different sources of information. And you have another poll. <laughs> all right, great. So, um, yeah, I think as Riaz moves into the next section of his talk, you know, the question comes up of, you know, where are you, our audience, in terms of your own adoption of Kubernetes? And, um, you know, I think, you know, the question is, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, some of you might already be there. You're, all of your production workloads are running Kubernetes. I'll be surprised, but we'll see. Uh, you're drawing up plans and you're testing some apps in Kubernetes. You're thinking about, you know, what your infrastructure looks like and could be moved there or <laughs> I love this one, Riaz. I don't need no stinking Kubernetes, right? You know, that's your, uh, <laughs> I don't know why you'd be on today's webinar if you felt that way, but uh, let's see, <laughs> give, give people a few seconds to sign, to, to, to pull their answers. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I see them coming in and uh, we'll give you about 10 more seconds and share them. There you go. So, uh, you know, kind of a good mix. I mean, people are either in production already and with a you know bulk of their workloads there or uh you know just just drawing up plans you know they're doing some apps maybe in pilot mode so but you know definitely uh you know strong strong in the first two sure super super <laughs> let's then jump into the uh the, the end meat of uh, today's presentation uh taking in from what we've learned that organizations tend to expose a lot of uh, information right and attackers when they want to focus on uh, figuring out kubernetes clusters right and targeting companies that run uh, kubernetes on production or while they're testing and as long as you can get into uh, the cluster you would begin with uh, a structure okay and this is this is uh, this is something i've seen over the last decade of working with a lot of other security folks especially in the offensive security domain all attackers, irrespective of how unstructured they are, follow a set of tactics right, to reach their end goal. I am extremely unstructured uh, in my real life, right? In, in the real world, I tend to have uh, notes all over the place and they're extremely uh, with a very short attention span. The regardless of what uh, your structure or runs, you, you know, you, you, whether you have a structure or not, attackers will follow a set of tactics to reach their goal, right? And each of these tactics, you, you could consider them as milestones. They tend to have techniques by which their tactic is fulfilled. Right? And I'm trying to slowly build into what the MITRE attack uh, framework looks like. Right? And depending on the technology that uh, is being targeted, the tactic may differ, but often aligns with you, the attacker will perform initial discovery. There would be some amount of code execution. There would be an escalation of privileges. You want more right, from your access that you've obtained. There's going to be persistence in some form or the other. There's going to be evasion or evidence removal in some cases where the attackers don't want to know that, don't want others to know that they're there. And eventually ending with an abuse or impact of whatever access you've obtained, right? All of this maps to what the MITRE attack threat matrix is. In a sense, this is a globally accessible knowledge base of adversary tactics explaining uh, what an attacker would do across different technologies and the techniques that they would that that they would use for attacking those technologies, right? And all of these are based on real-world observations, and the link is right there if you want to take a look. Several matrices have been created for various uh, tech verticals, right? You have Windows, Linux being the most popular ones. You have AWS, GCP that have come out, right? And a bunch of mobile OS uh, tactics and techniques as well. These can be used by both offensive security folks as well as uh, defenders, right? Offensive security folks, obviously, uh, the information is straightforward. You can pick up a technique and make, oh, this is what I need to do to, uh, you know, complete this tactic within the within the framework. And for defenders, the information is equally useful uh, to identify the attack path that uh, an attacker will take, the bad guys will take, so that I can build my defense in depth based on what I see, right? 
Microsoft created a similar threat matrix for Kubernetes, and that's going to be our uh, focus for today's uh, presentation. We're going to take a look at what the MITRE, uh, this is not exactly the MITRE uh, attack uh, threat matrix. Essentially, this is Microsoft's version of using the threat matrix as a framework, uh, you know, in, in, in the framework, creating one for Kubernetes, right? An attack like threat matrix for uh, Kubernetes. And most of the techniques that are going to be mentioned uh, within the tactics. Right, bunch of them are repeatable to achieve different uh, tactical milestones. Okay, so a, a simple way to read this, if you're looking at this for so the first time, a simple way to read this uh, table is the ones in blue, the initial access, execution, persistence, are tactics. Each tactic has techniques that attackers use. Right, and this particular uh, table is focused on Kubernetes. Okay. Let's jump into uh, taking a look at what, uh, and I'm going to cover examples from. I'm not going to cover all techniques. We, that's just going to be uh, a whole day session if I if I jump into each one of them. Right? Given in the time that we have, let's take a look at uh, some examples from each uh, tactic, a technique from each tactic, and see what it looks like in the real world. Okay. Uh, from initial access, let's uh, take a look at one of the most common ones, which is the exposed dashboard. Right. In initial access for the uh, tactic to become uh, pliable, you have uh, an attacker figuring out an exposed dashboard, right, for the Kubernetes cluster. When you say exposed dashboard, we're talking about the Kubernetes dashboard, right? The screenshot on on the screen right now that you can see uh, was uh, taken by the you know the amazing folks at uh, Redlock.io, right? When they were researching. Uh, what kind of dashboards or uh, Kubernetes dashboards are visible on the internet, and they ended up uh, on this particular uh, dashboard. This dashboard belongs to Tesla, right? And uh, this does not have any uh, authentication or authorization. Simply browsing to that endpoint allowed them to browse the Kubernetes uh, cluster configuration, right? And from the secret, they were able to pick out AWS SD credentials. And uh, this was pretty popular back in, uh, I think this was last year, right? Uh, covered by a lot of major news agencies where Tesla's Kubernetes dashboard was exposed. That, that was the news that uh, came out. And uh, I'm going to come back to this dashboard again at the end uh, with an interesting story with the impact that they were uh, trying to discover, right? With some uh, things around crypto mining. And then we'll touch upon that when we reach the last tactic in the, uh, you know, the, the threat matrix. And, but this is what an exposed dashboard looks like on the internet. And you could reach this either by scanning the entire internet and there are tools available to do that, do that or there are services like Shodan, for example. And if you craft your search query properly, you'll be able to find a bunch of these on the internet. Right? This is another example of uh, initial access where an attacker was able to gain access to uh, you know, the, the files required to create your own cube config okay, using an SSR. And the, in the bug bounty community, this is a really popular bug because the S, this was an uh, the SSRF was used to uh, extract, you know, uh, image by image from the uh, image itself. You were, the attack the attacker was able to extract client certificate, the private key, right, the token. All of that then became part of uh, the query that he made using Qcuttle and was able to then gain access to the cluster, at least to uh, specific namespaces. And if you look at the bottom most screenshot, you can see that uh, the attacker was able to get a shell uh, into one of the pods that were running. Right? So application vulnerability definitely is a way to get uh, initial access inside your Kubernetes cluster. And multiple large companies have in the past, we've seen this, uh, have exposed their Kubernetes dashboard without authentication to the internet. Right? Uh, the kubelet rest api ports 10 to 50 which is read right you can make you can use a curl request to start uh, a pod in, in the namespace in a namespace using if 2 10 to 50 is open and then 10 to 55 uh, from older kubernetes they still exposed 10 to 55 allows you to read kubernetes configuration that's a read only port right and uh, both of these are widely still accessible for older versions of kubernetes running out there Application vulnerability is one of the most common ways by which attackers can gain access to uh, your cluster. Uh, you're looking at vulnerabilities like uh, any vulnerability that especially can make a network request because you then use that to read configuration data and uh, you know essentially you need either the access to uh, a dashboard or you need access to the cube configuration file. Right? So uh, vulnerabilities like SSRF, your LFIs, path traversals, arbitrary file downloads, right? All of these vulnerabilities that allow you access to the backend would give you, uh, you know, some level of access to the cluster. So that's what your initial access is about, right? Moving on to the next tactic that attackers use, right? And execution being uh, 
the eventual outcome of this like you've gained some level of initial access now you want to move to executing your custom code and the screenshot that you have uh, that's visible on screen the left uh, screenshot is is a yaml description of a pod that when uh, you know applied to your cluster would give you access to the underlying node itself right and uh, because the host pid is shared right the host pid is uh, set to true it's shared with the underlying node that is running the pod you can actually access the process is running on the underlying node right and uh, new container being the uh, technique technique that i'm talking about under execution once the ability to interact with the cluster is within right uh, regardless of how expert dashboard you config file and this is a more uh, hilarious and common one uh, simply pulling them off a developer's laptop using a client side vulnerability right uh, or secret leak by an application vulnerability attackers will attempt to gain a shell access to uh, the cluster and right? sometimes the tactic can also lead to a privilege escalation like in the screenshot that we saw uh, you then from using a single execution you'd be able to gain access to the underlying node itself right so from the node then you could move on uh, use docker for example to if that's the container runtime you'd be able to regardless of what the container runtime is actually uh, use that to see what other pods and containers are running like access logs you've already gained those privileges inside the cluster right so execution can overlap with uh, privilege escalation right Next, we look at persistence. That's the uh, next obvious technique uh, according to the threat matrix. And uh, the example that I have is of a Kubernetes cron job. Uh, the screenshot on the left shows a Kubernetes cron job that uh, runs every minute. And as soon as it runs, it's going to get you a reverse shell on the IP address that you specify within the YAML. Right? And this is a standard bash. If you folks, uh, you know, the standard uh, reverse shell that you have. Uh, or one liner bash that allows you to gain uh, you know, shell execution capabilities to uh, an endpoint. This YAML uh, is because it's a cron job. Cron jobs create pods when trying to complete the task that you're supposed to do. The you what you would have if you look at the right side of the screen, the screenshot there shows you have a reverse shell that has come in from the pod onto the attacker machine, right? The attacker machine's IP address is what is specified as the cron job, and this is persistence. You, you would have uh, even if uh, somebody is sweeping through the cluster, tends to look at namespaces and pods, the cron job, even if they disconnect uh, any outbound traffic, the cron job ensures that the reverse shell jumps back to life every minute, right? So there's some level of persistence that is created through the uh, cron job for the attacker. And Riaz, in your experience, um, you know, what are people doing when they get in? I mean, are they, are, are, do you have a sense of the kinds of, of malicious activity? Is it, you know, I know there's been a lot of crypto mining and things like that, but any other types yeah. of attacks or what are you seeing? So, uh, because the, uh, the, the feature or the capability of a cluster, uh, the most important capability of a cluster uh, that uh, is, uh, you know that attracts uh, attackers is the ability to scale right so if uh, uh, which is why crypto mining uh, is such a popular outcome of an attack on on your cluster because uh, when an attacker runs their deployment that is actually going to do the crypto mining based on resources it's automatically going to scale right and that's profitable to the attacker apart from that you also uh, you know if you if you have uh, if you have any jump offs connected to the cluster, for example, an attacker might want to jump back into a different section of the network, right? And data is definitely something that attackers go after. Right? And that's been forever, right? Since the day the first attack was launched, right? data is something that attackers will obviously go, uh, go after. And the crypto uh, mining uh, is kind of unique to Kubernetes, like you say, because you know, you've got these yeah, almost yeah. unlimited resources. And <laughs> the first time you find out is when you start seeing your, your costs of your AWS or Azure environment going crazy, right? You know? Yeah, yeah. And, and the interesting thing is that uh, for extremely large enterprise environments, right, where their AWS and Azure or GC builds all, are anyways in the tens of thousands of dollars, uh, starting a deployment that does crypto mining would, uh, you know, would not raise a lot of eyebrows because the uh, the the bills that would come out would uh, essentially be, it look like it's part of the workload bill that you would get in every month anyways, right? So they're hiding in plain sight. That's that's the kind of uh, reference I'm trying to make. Thanks. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So yes, uh, the Kubernetes cron job is uh, a very nice example of how persistence could be maintained. 
right? Other ways that attackers do, but they're not limited. Again, this is uh, from experience of mapping them back from the infra uh, base days back to a Kubernetes cluster. Adding SSH keys to the underlying node once you've gained access, right? That's that's an easy win for an attacker. Uh, creating jobs, cron jobs should gain reverse shell. That's what we saw. Shadow admins, uh, definitely uh, an attacker would create a cluster role or role that has the ability to administer the entire cluster. And uh, they would use names that uh, you know would mimic something that the organization's infrastructure team has created, right? And we'll see a couple of examples of those as well. Uh, use a writable host path bound uh, to gain access to code to config files that the application is possibly hosting. Reuse secrets and a lot of organizations are trying to get to this. A lot of organizations, individual organizations, uh, tend to reuse uh, secrets. Uh, you know, depending on what kind of uh, workload they're in, right? It could be an app, could be uh, Keys that they are, uh, you know, attempting to have across different staging environments or you know, in dev environments. But key reuse and uh, secret reuse is, is a definite thing that uh, a lot of organizations still deal with, right? Um, storage of uh, secrets inside config maps, for example, which is not recommended because config maps are supposed to show configuration information. But uh, some examples on the internet definitely show secrets being stored inside config maps. So developers tend to do that as well. Right? Persistence from there is also is, is a possibility. Adding a backdoor binary uh, to a running container, yes, that's that's also definite uh, technique that attackers do try. Right? Uh, I believe that attackers like to persist in most networks for the thrill of seeing how long it takes for the network admins to uh, detect them right? and uh, boot them out. Right, and uh, I'm, I'm sure there's like a attacker forum where, uh, like your Linux uptime, uh, you know, subreddit, essentially talking about, oh, I've been inside this network for over a year and nobody's seen me yet. Right? <laughs> so that that's something that uh, possibly attackers do, uh, or use the network as a means to, uh, you know, further compromise uh, whatever is available for the organization. And we're going to see a couple of examples of lateral uh, escalation, right, uh, later on in the slides. Or it could be simply symbolic uh, as a trophy in their collection uh, of networks that they've compromised. Do you, on see, to react, do you yeah. see people actually yeah. sharing any of this on the dark web? I mean, is it has it reached a point where people will say, "Hey, I got into this one," and uh, you know, letting other 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 hackers have that same way in? There have been cases in the past, and then uh, you know, uh, leaks that have occurred on uh, which accidentally other attackers have stumbled upon because they found it or pasted on paste bin or something like that with active and live backdoor credentials to something uh, to a possibly large uh, you know network that was there. Uh, Facebook had uh, a bounty that they paid out for uh, an application that was compromised by a bug bounty hunter. But what the bug bounty hunter realized was post him compromising the application. He saw a lot of shells that were already planted inside the application, right? And this this was also covered uh, in the media. Right? So it's, it's it, I think it's a, it's a definite uh, possibility that attackers do share uh, trusted attackers, especially they share uh, you know their their trophies because are there already. You need some kind of access to a different network environment. Hey, here's one. Like take this off my shoulders. And so that that's possibly uh, that's that, that's something possibly is happening uh, out there. All right, so uh, we have the next tactic, which is privilege escalation, uh, which is uh, uh, the example that I have here is of a cluster admin binding, right? And uh, this is on my home cluster uh, that I was running, and I created like a bunch of uh, cluster roles that have the cluster admin binding to them, right? And uh, the steps to create that are then the screenshot. But essentially, what this would allow is if an attacker is able to gain access to a cluster role, right, that has the ability, or rather, is bound to the cluster admin cluster role binding, the token that is generated from the secret, the token that is extracted from the secret, would give them complete access to the entire Kubernetes cluster. And you could use this token inside your curl request directly to the API server. You could create a chip config file, right? But essentially, giving you access to the entire cluster. And a lot of uh, you know third-party uh, Software that you install, uh, any workloads that you deploy, right? Um, Kubeflow being one of them, for example, um, which is a standard ML AI uh, workflow based uh, product on top of Kubernetes. Uh, when you deploy that onto your cluster, and if you've not uh, you know, counted the number of cluster roles and roles it creates inside the namespaces, that it creates about four or five namespaces, the default installation path, and it creates over about 70 to 80 different cluster roles. 
and it's understandable because it does a lot of activity and it requires this kind of credential but a lot of those cluster roles have privileges that they they ideally should not be having right so that's just an example in the wild and uh, the dashboard kubernetes dashboard being another one of them it's, it's required the kubernetes dashboard admin uh, cluster role requires that kind of access but if an attacker is able to gain access to that token game over that they have access to the entire cluster from there Escalation of privileges is uh, an important step right, for an attacker to gain access to additional resources uh, or uh, uh, if the attacker wants to be in stealth mode, this is where they would uh, sit around. A right? couple of examples where these attackers can escalate privileges, reading secrets, tokens, credentials, you pull them out, you try it out on a different cluster that you've obtained uh, and the token might possibly work, the key user uh, keys might work. The managed Kubernetes on AWS GCP, they have a service token map to uh, the IAM platform, right? This is accessible as a mount point inside a pod. If you've gained access to a pod as an attacker inside, you would then be able to access to the service uh, account and the token itself. Uh, detecting which pods are running as privileged pods and then using an exec to gain access to those pods from there moving down to the node, right? Uh, and then from there moving using a Docker uh, command to move to a different section of the cluster. That's again uh, escalating your privileges. And the more interesting one uh, that a lot of attackers tend to do is, uh, especially for managed clusters, if you're uh, if they can access to a pod, access to the instance metadata can allow uh, reading of IAM credentials if they've been attached to uh, the instance, for example, right? Uh, if you're running uh, AWS, no, if you hosted uh, uh, your Kubernetes on uh, AWS, not on EKS, but in, on uh, you know, instances that are running inside AWS and you've attached an IAM cred. Using a pod, you could jump to uh, the instance metadata, extract credentials, then move to the cred, right? So that's, that's an escalation of privilege right there. Uh, defense evasion is something that attackers would definitely want to try once they've uh, gained some kind of privilege escalation because, hey, now I have access to the cluster and uh, I'm kind of administrator inside the cluster but I want to ensure that I remain hidden or uh, my traces of all the attacks, the commands that have been trying, they're erased, right? The example that I have, the screenshot here, again, uh, the ML on the left is uh, of, of uh, Ubuntu uh, pod that is being created, but with the name uh, that maps or matches something else that's running inside Cube system. If you have, if you have core DNS, right? Uh, inside Cube system, if you do a Cube kernel get pods, you'd see a bunch of core DNS uh, pods running. Right? But if an attacker creates, which is what the uh, right side of the screenshot is, if an attacker uh, uses this YAML file and applies this to your cluster, a pod is going to be created with a, the same name as a similar name as uh, other core DNS pods running. And so it's going to be very difficult to figure out which one's uh, the actual and which is the attacker sitting in plain, hiding in plain sight. Right? So pod name similarity is a, a definite defensive vision that attackers do try. The others being uh, the ability to delete logs that pods create by gaining access to the underlying node and uh, all pods have uh, all pods generate logs that are stored in var log pods and the same link there uh, the underlying uh, if you have access to the underlying node you'll be able to delete the spot from uh, delete the log files from uh, from the directory right the cook cuttle delete events hyphen all is a very dangerous command should not never be run on prod but uh, this it kind of erases the entire event log of uh, kubernetes right across all namespaces uh, the attacker could also launch pods in reserve namespaces to match other workloads. That we, that's what we saw with core DNS. And uh, the technique that uh, the threat metrics also talks about is to hide their origin IP addresses using proxies. Right? Moving on to credential access, uh, coming to the uh, you know the final parts of what the attackers uh, tend to do. They've now gone from obtaining access, executed their code, they've persisted using a backdoor, uh, using a cron job, they've escalated their privileges using a cluster admin. Uh, binding, they have evaded defenses uh, by starting a pod with a similar name, right? Now they're going to essentially try and they're comfortable inside their cluster and the cluster that they've compromised. They're going to now try and see what else is visible uh, inside the cluster in terms of secrets, right? Credentials are extremely uh, beneficial to attackers uh, from the viewpoint of that you can reuse creds if required. And also, they allow access to regions that you might not have access, regardless of whether your status is a cluster admin or not. Right? Applications, for example, if you want to access the application uh, and from there access data. Right? So, uh, what you have uh, on the left is uh, me trying to access the Kubernetes API endpoint without any. 
token. And then on the right, I am using the service account mount point to gain access to the token and passing that through a curl request, right? And using that to uh, try and uh, see what is visible to me as, as an attacker. The, the container service account is what I've used here to leak the token, and this is mounted by default in every pod unless you specifically have it written in your YAML to not mount the service account. And the default service account of the namespace is mounted by default. Right, so the default service account is mounted by default. That, that's uh, the correct way to say it. Right, so the token is extracted, and then uh, if the token is privileged, you have access to the Kubernetes API from there. Most attackers will try and identify uh, alternate regions. Once they've gained some level of access, they, they would look at resources, what else is visible, what else can you see from your vantage point inside your network, right? Uh, they try and uh, reach protected regions, which may require credentials that would, uh, you know, uh, otherwise they would, they would hit a 401 unauthorized, right? Uh, some re places where attackers tend to find secrets and credentials, the Kubernetes secret store itself, uh, using the service principle mounted within the underlying node, which is what the example you saw. Uh, the pod, uh, a pod mounted container service account token, app credits in config maps, pod descriptions, hard coded within application files, right? Any of these places where secrets uh, can reside would be a good uh, place for credential access to for the tactic to be completed. Discovery is a little, uh, I mean, in my personal opinion, uh, discovery comes a little too late inside the threat matrix, right? And I say this because uh, most of the techniques that uh, this tactic has uh, are pretty much uh, useful to an attacker if they're done at the beginning of the threat matrix, right? And uh, for the sake of completion, let's cover this as well. Uh, what I have here is a screenshot of uh, an, a bash prompt inside uh, a pod running on uh, AKS. Right, and uh, because the the pod has privileged, uh, it's running in the privileged container. I now have access to the underlying node, right? And if you can see the host name, AKS Agent Pool, right? I am from there using. Uh, I actually didn't need to do this because the attacker pod itself would be able to access the uh, metadata instance endpoint address, which for AWS Azure and GCP is the same: 169.254, 169.254, and then extract metadata instance information. The metadata instance information is extremely well documented by all three cloud providers, right? And um, you know, AWS recently implemented uh, the version two, right? That requires a header that has to be passed to the token. But if, as long as you have a shell access to a place where the 169 to 54 address is going to be accessible, right? It doesn't matter what header requirements your uh, you know instance metadata uh, requires, you'd still be able to gain access to the instance metadata. Why is this interesting? The instance metadata is because this provides information about the instance that is running. And like the node being an instance, virtual instance inside Azure, has some amount of meta information that is attached to it, including uh, where it is running, what kind of, uh, you know, if there's any SSH public keys attached, right? With AWS, if you have IAM role attached to the instance, you can actually extract the credentials from the instance metadata itself, which you can then reuse into an AWS command, right? Um, the secret key in access and token that is going to be available through the instance metadata. Another common uh, vector that it's actually the most common attack vector if you have uh, pod access inside uh, an AWS uh, environment, right? Uh, as I said, this tactic is described too late in the threat matrix because most of the attackers will obviously perform additional discovery uh, in, in the earlier stages. Um, a lot of these techniques are already uh, covered, uh, you know, uh, in the beginning of the tactic, the threat matrix itself, either via a cube config or service tokens, access to the KTS API service obtained. Right? If an attacker has reached this far, already uh, the privileged access level is assumed at this point in time. Uh, we also saw the TCP ports to 10 to 50 and 10 to 55 that uh, give the attacker read write uh, privileges to the cube API server. Uh, depending on what code is uh, accessible and what kind of authorization is applicable to them, right? Attackers also tend to perform additional network mapping using tools like Nmap. Uh, again, um, some attackers tend to do this. Some attackers simply would uh, read the service and endpoint information using uh, using the API itself, right? Uh, that is pretty uh, approximate of what that's actually exactly what is running within the network. So you don't need to do an Nmap scan on the on the pod of the service network from uh, your access that you've obtained. Right. For managed Kubernetes, again, access to the underlying cloud platform is possible through, uh, you know, uh, service uh, account that's mounted, right, or secrets that are leaked through the instance metadata API endpoint. 
from moving from pod to the node or from pod to the cloud directly right so that's that's what uh, you'd end up doing in your discovery uh, tactic as i said a lot of those are uh, repeats the same applies to lateral movement as well if you notice the uh, techniques that i mentioned in lateral movement are a bunch of things that we've already covered in the past right uh, because as an attacker when you move from initial access all the way to impact you tend to end uh, you tend to do uh, a bunch of lateral movement things parallelly while you're moving through uh, the attack matrix right uh, this is an example of a dashboard access that i have uh, had once I have gained access to a cube config, I can simply, uh, you know, proxy the uh, proxy access to the dashboard and uh, access it from my local machine. Right? And uh, the dashboard itself allows you to gain access to uh, a pod. You can gain a shell, and then uh, you have access to any configuration information from there on. Using this shell, you can gain access to the cloud provider if uh, this is hosted on a managed uh, cluster. So we have we have a question Sorry. come in about you know how yeah. do the attackers find the api endpoints and then how do they authenticate to it i think this was you know uh you know, a couple of slides back okay. um yeah okay so the question I think uh, we're talking about uh, right at the beginning of initial access, right? As I mentioned, um, to gain initial access, the attacker requires some uh, sense of uh, where the cluster is located. I could run an internet wide sweep to figure out uh, common, uh, you know, ports, standard, uh, uh, the API is hosted on 6443 exposed to the internet or 443, it's an HTTPS API server. It's like any other API server on the internet, right? But identifying that it's a Kubernetes dashboard is a tricky one because there's, for the default uh, Kubernetes API server, there's no telltale sign in the headers that tells you it is it is an uh, you know a Kubernetes endpoint, right? But I showed you an example at the beginning of where if you have priority and fairness, for example, features enabled, a specific header comes up uh, in the in the responses that tells you that this is a Kubernetes dashboard. Uh, sorry, and this is a Kubernetes API server. Right. And in most cases, you do require authorization, but there are a bunch of examples on the Internet live right now that don't require uh, authorization to access the API server. And this could simply be honeypot sitting out there for people uh, like you and me trying to figure out what exploring. Right. But the fact that uh, not all of them may be honeypots is a definite uh, you know, possibility. Right. And uh, again, obtaining access to a cube config file because you've uh, compromised a developer laptop, you've compromised um, you know, an application that's hosted on uh, Kubernetes. From there, you've the example that I gave was the SSRF bug in Etsy. From there, accessing uh, you know the environment variables that contains the certificates. Right, you could construct your own kube config and then access uh, the API server. So, fi finding the endpoint is uh, port scan away or using an open source of information like Shodan. And authorization is that piece requires some work where you have to either find an Express dashboard or uh, a compromised image in a registry. That's uh, those are the techniques that's listed there. And my favorite being the application vulnerability, uh, you know, using an SSRF or something similar that allows you to gain access, shell access possibly to a pod running inside the Kubernetes cluster. So it sounds like the authentication, getting past that is the harder part, right? You know, finding, yes. finding them is easier. <laughs> Yes, yes, because see, if, if you're talking about an application vulnerability, an application that's running on top of uh, Kubernetes, the authentication layer is never reached, right? Because you're using the application which is running on Kubernetes as your window, right? You you compromise the app, you're already inside uh, the cluster. You, you've gained shell access to the pod, right? And you're already inside the cluster. And once you're inside the cluster, you can access a bunch of things uh, based on where you are. You could use the service token, you could gain privileges, go to the node, use Docker, start a bunch of other things, move from there to the cloud, right? Again, as I said, unstructured, but you eventually go through each of these uh, tactics at some point in time. All right, great. Yeah, we've got about 10 minutes left, Riaz. I'll let you get back to your slides, but but thanks for that. Uh, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. I'll just uh, wrap this up, uh, the, the MITRE attack framework, uh, reaching the uh, impact uh, tactic, right? 
the uh, essential idea is for a, every attacker, as I said, could be a symbolic trophy in their uh, bucket of clusters that have compromised, which is the rarer version. But there is obviously some motive that attackers go with, right? And we're looking at uh, either access to data, they're looking at uh, resource hijacking. In this particular case, this is uh, Tesla's dashboard, uh, Kubernetes dashboard, which the folks at Redlock, when they gained access to the Kubernetes dashboard, and they realized that there was already a crypto mining uh, deployment that was running on inside the cluster, right? And uh, the uh, it took time for the folks at Tesla also to discover this. They actually figured it out when Redlock folks told them. Essentially, because uh, the deployment that was running did not start any large instances or was not using a lot of resources, so they wanted the the attackers wanted the crypto mining to happen. But they kept the footprint really minimal so that it didn't flag any you know monitoring that they had in place, right? So they're kind of a little stealthy. So resource hijacking definitely is something that Andy you and I spoke about, right? So this this is a definite outcome of what attackers would look for, right? The potential end games, uh, some of them documented data destruction by rolling back deployments, removing volumes, claims. If you're a cluster admin, you could possibly print down the entire cluster, hijacking resources to perform alternate tasks. Altering any state to create a denial of service, right? Any of these could be the impact that the attacker would be looking for. Okay, that's uh, this is our attack the tactic that we've taken, the route that we've taken to reach to the impact, right? And uh, we have a quick poll, Andy. Uh, we want to get. Uh, uh, let's see what everyone says about All this. All right, one. great. Yeah, this is our last poll, and uh, you know, so you know, I guess the you know, the question here is, you know. How do you ensure security of your cloud infrastructure and cluster today? You know, what are you already doing? So, you know, do you rely on the cloud platform providers to uh, protect it and trust the defaults? Are you doing any kind of, you know, pen testing and, and internal reviews? Have you done any perimeter hardening, hardening you know, implementing uh, least privileges, you know, following CIS best practices? There's a Kubernetes CIS benchmark out there that uh, we, for example, Aqua's cube bench will help you with, and then uh, you're doing both numbers two and three with log monitoring, analysis, and alerting. You're all over this, so let's go ahead and give, give folks a, a, a ten or twenty seconds here to to answer the the poll, and then we'll share the results. Sure. Looks like we still have some numbers coming in. Uh, yeah. But I think the, uh, this has been a great talk, Riaz. I know we'll we'll wrap up here in a minute, but I think uh, been a lot of questions along the way. We'll get to Q and A before we before we go. So let's go ahead and share those results. Uh, you know, people are pretty confident that they're they're there. You know, more than half saying they they they've got this down, and then a, a bunch more I would say relying on um, you know some core best practices in terms of hardening and privileges. You know, this is, nice. what, what do you think about these answers? Are they consistent with what you see in the real world? Yes, uh, so uh, nobody trusts the cloud platform itself to, uh, to do the job completely, right? So that was just a filler option that I just want to see what's the distribution around uh, two, three, and four. Uh, four being, I think, in my opinion, least that people uh, do in the personally people that I've spoken to, right? I can't see the shared results. So what, what, what's the option with the fourth one? What was the spread on that one? What, what was the statistic? Oh, so, so yeah, so almost 60% said they were. They were doing both, you know, pen testing and the hardening and lease privileges. Yeah. Oh, nice, nice. I think I, I'm talking to the wrong set of people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're looking at your slides, and your video. It's always tricky. Anyway, all right, great. Let's uh, let's get on to recommendations. What do you? How do you suggest people yes. deal with this? Right, so I have a bunch of uh, tips and tricks that uh, uh, you know uh, over a period of time I've collected, uh, especially when I was trying to figure out the whole Kubernetes uh, technology. Right, and coming from an offensive security world, what would uh, Kubernetes administrators do that would uh, you know that would prevent me from uh, gaining access or figuring out uh, what what is the state of the cluster? Right, keeping Kubernetes updated is is a no-brainer. This is something that uh, your cloud providers, uh, you know, if you're trying it as a managed uh, cluster. This is something that they would uh, take care of as as long as you own the upgrade uh, bit, right? Uh, I think this version 1.20.4, uh, which is currently uh, what Kubernetes is, right? And uh, they have different patch uh, metrics, right? So some of them they support patches for a year. I think version 1.18 and below is for nine months, right? Just just be uh, conscious of what your version of Kubernetes is and try and keep it updated. 
Uh, restricting SSL access definitely uh, to, to the nodes to only trusted IP addresses is something that you should definitely practice. Uh, using network policies to prevent attackers from jumping between namespaces, right? If it, even if the attacker has compromised one part of the cluster, they should not be able to see something else. Or even if they see, they should not be able to gain access to it uh, using you know lateral movement within the cluster. Network policies comes to your aid there. Uh, definitely audit your roles, bindings, service accounts, IAM access, look for shadow admins, use your RBAC, uh, the cluster, the Kubernetes cluster, provide judiciously. Right. Audit all your cluster roles and uh, you know, any role bindings that are there, especially for service accounts. Right. Then attackers might have created. Scan images in your pipeline using tools. 3D, as I mentioned, and a wonderful tool uh, to identify vulnerabilities that uh, your images may have that may become potential security hazards. Remove deployments that are no longer required and uh, definitely run pods with a security context where you have a user defined, right? Uh, one, zero, zero, one. Say, definitely say no to it. Right. Uh, today, if you go back and look at your uh, cluster, and if you do a get pods, see how many of them describe your pods and see how many of them are running as root. Right. So that that itself uh, could be a problem. Use namespaces to create logical segregation. Segregation. Do not store secrets uh, in environment variables, especially pod description if you have them. Uh, ensure minimum visibility from the outside. Right. That's like a defense in depth approach that you take. Uh, definitely take application security consideration. You could have the most hardened cluster, but if an application is vulnerable, the attacker has a direct door inside your cluster. Right? Uh, being wary of suspicious looking outbound traffic, use hardening guidelines, CIs, uh, benchmarks, highly recommended for Kubernetes, and tools like Kubebench that you mentioned and earlier to identify potential misconfigurations. Monitoring and um, you know creating an actionable roadmap, right, into what a cluster is doing, uh, who has what kind of access, what privileges different components have, and actioning any monitoring alerts that you've got is a definite way to uh, ensure your cluster remains hard and insecure right at the end of the day. Um, I plan on uh, writing a blog post with expanding on all the tips that I've mentioned here uh, with examples on how you could do this. I will be creating an actionable blog post, right, uh, for updates and followers on, uh, with a Twitter handle, probably link. That's our company's uh, Twitter handle. Closing the talk, <laughs> our favorite Dilbert, right? Like this is like a, a perfunctory, obligatory uh, image that I have on most communities uh, talks that I do, right? Yeah, you I'm know sure the you technology, can... you know, has become mainstream <laughs> when Dilbert starts talking yeah. about it, right? You know, I'm sure this went over like, the head yeah. of many Dilbert readers, awesome. but. Um, you know, for everybody on this call, it's like, oh man, I'm I'm yeah. right in the middle of it. Yeah, but we love it. I we can relate it. to that. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's it. go ahead and um, there are a couple more questions that we can look at here. Uh, you know, we have just a few sure. more minutes, but um, you know, again, you know, thank you for sharing uh, sharing this. We did have a number of people say they they thought this was great, and can they get a copy of it? Um, so uh, there we'll, we'll be sending that out uh, after. <laughs> Um, so people yeah. will be able and, to see that. And just just to add, sorry, uh, just to add, uh, the YAML files that I described uh, in the presentation, I'll be uh, tweeting, uh, you know, like a GitHub repo or something like that, where, where all the YAMLs are hosted, so you can try them out in your uh, test clusters at home, right? And uh, our Twitter uh, is uh, right here on the screen. That's my Twitter handle. And you can definitely reach me on my email address, uh, riyadhatcloud.com. Take a look at our blog as well. We have a lot of interesting uh, blog posts that we've written and a full rundown of uh, the MITRE uh, threat framework as well. Right? So that's why everyone's going to So uh, there was a question. If, uh, thanks for that. I think people have your email and then you can reach out. A um, couple of questions here. One, in a managed Kubernetes environment, so um, you know, something like AKS or EKS, um, isn't the node managed by the cloud provider? And in that case, would the instance metadata endpoint, um, you know, end up giving up cloud managed node details? That, that's a good one. So um, even though the cluster is managed by uh, AKS and AWS, the, uh, the master node is what you don't have access to, right? But the worker nodes definitely you can get a shell, and that's the uh, screenshot I had earlier of. Let me try and figure out see where it is. Yeah, this is uh, a shell that I've obtained uh, on the worker node, and this is running inside a managed uh, cluster on the case. Right, so the instance information is aligned is is off the worker node of the managed cluster, and so the information definitely is part of the uh, managed Kubernetes environment. 
but there are there is there's definitely going to be some information that is going to become useful to the attacker based on how you've configured this right all right we have one more question we're running out of time but uh, uh what's the best someone said they were looking for your recommendations on the best option for secrets management on aks any any suggestions <laughs> I don't have any personal favorites. Uh, okay. Because <laughs> I'm, yeah, I, I'm coming from the offensive background, right? So, uh, I've heard Vault is is a good uh, use case, but uh, I'm not sure, right? So. Yeah. All right. No, yeah, I think a lot of people are using Vault in uh, in that environment <laughs> as well. All right. Well, let's go ahead and wrap up. Uh, thanks again. You know, great talk. Uh, you know, I think it's just so. Uh, it, it, you know, it's so great to see the from the perspective of the attacker and what it looks like, and you know, the really technical presentation in terms of how things really look and work. Um, so thanks again, and for those of you, you you'll see a link in the in the go to meeting, uh, go to webinar meeting um, to next week's session and the uh, the topic, uh, which will be taking the work out of network policy. Um, I th and this will be our last, our tenth of this series, and uh, you'll have that to to, and and you have the link to register as well. So uh, you can stop by the aquasec.com website and and just sign up as uh, if that's easier. But thanks again, Riaz, and appreciate you sharing your knowledge with 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 our audience. And everybody, have a great day. Uh, and stay Thank safe. Thank you so much, Andy. Thank you so much, Andy. Take care. Bye, folks.